Hello, uh, I'm Dr. Mary Doherty. I'm a consultant anaesthetist at Our Lady's Hospital uh, Navin in Ireland, um, and I'm founder of Autistic Doctors International. My name is Dr. Sebastian Shaw. I'm an honorary clinical lecturer at Brighton and Sussex Medical School, and I am the research lead for Autistic Doctors International. This study involved an exploration of the barriers faced by autistic adults when accessing primary health care and the associated adverse outcomes. We already know that autistic people make up 1-2% to of the population. Most do not have a co-occurring intellectual disability, most are adult, and, most, um, are, and many are still undiagnosed. We know that autistic adults face increased rates of many physical and mental health conditions, along with a decreased life expectancy. Use of emergency departments are increased. And the admission rate from the emergency department um, is also increased, along with, most worryingly, in hospital mortality rates. Lack of autism training for healthcare providers is well documented. 40% of GPs have had no training whatsoever in autism, and only 25% are confident communicating with and making reasonable adjustments for autistic patients. So our aim was to explore the barriers to primary health care and to investigate if these barriers were linked to self-reported adverse health care outcomes. We started with a consultation at an autistic conference, Autscape, and we asked autistic people, what do you wish your GP knew about autism? We used the information to develop an online survey, which was completed by 507 autistic adults and 157 non-autistic adults across the world, and we then compared the responses from the two groups. We found that 80% of autistic respondents reported a difficulty visiting a GP when needed, in comparison to 37% of the non-autistic group. Two thirds reported untreated physical and mental health conditions. And most worryingly, one in three autistic people reported an untreated serious or potentially life-threatening condition. A similar number reported requiring more extensive treatment or surgery than if they had presented sooner. 62% reported difficulty using the telephone to make an appointment as a barrier to healthcare. 56% delayed or avoided a needed GP appointment because of not being understood by their, by their doctor. Over half refer to the waiting room as a barrier due to the sensory environment. And um, we found that these barriers were associated with adverse healthcare outcomes, including untreated physical or mental health conditions, late presentations, reduced attendance for screening, and missed opportunities for early detection. Also, a need for more extensive therapy or surgery being required was also reported. Difficulty communicating with doctors and with the reception staff was associated with all adverse healthcare outcomes. Difficulty using the telephone, difficulty planning an appointment in advance, and the sensory environment in the waiting room was associated with most of the adverse outcomes. Difficulty waiting and inability to see a known doctor were also associated with adverse healthcare outcomes. We found no difference between autistic respondents who were formally diagnosed as autistic and those who self-identified in the difficulty attending a GP, the barriers experienced, or the adverse health care outcomes. So this study is important for a whole number of reasons. First and foremost, we have a duty to adjust our health care to meet the needs of all people who require access to our help. This is reflected in the NHS core values under the value of everyone counts. As Mary mentioned earlier, we know that three quarters of GPs do not feel confident communicating with autistic people and do not feel confident in providing adjustments to their care for autistic people. We predicted that this would reflect in barriers to access and worse health outcomes for the autistic population. Given we already knew that autistic people have more co-occurring mental, and physical health conditions, and that on average, we die 16 to 30 years younger than non-autistic people. That really was the driver for this study and is why our study is so important in the way it validates the struggles of autistic people in accessing healthcare. The other really important finding here 
was the fact that there were no differences between people self-identifying as autistic and those with formal diagnoses of autism. In Ireland and the UK, this is a really important finding. Over in Ireland, we know that there's no formal provision for autism diagnostics in their healthcare system. Whilst here in the UK, we do provide this service, there are often extremely long waits. This worsens into adulthood and can be many years following referral from a GP. As such, large numbers of the population know they're autistic at the core of their being, but are living without this formal diagnosis. And this study really acts to validate the fact that there is no difference whether or not we have yet to provide a formal label for people's own self-identity as being autistic. There are several important things that this study can and has led to. Um, so particularly from, from a UK perspective, um, the fact that as part of our results, we extrapolated the differences between the UK and non-UK participants and found that in many different areas related to the barriers in particular, the experiences in the UK were significantly worse. That's particularly helpful for us as a country to be able to look at our practice and our policies with regards to autistic patients and to see where we can do better. Another area that's important to think about here is future research on the back of this. And Mary and I are already collaborating with London South Bank University on several projects that have formed as a result of this study. This really has two wings to it. So on the one hand, we're doing a variety of work uh, with London South Bank, looking at annual health checks for autistic adults. Whilst these currently exist for people with learning disabilities in the UK, this right is not extended to autistic adults who do not have a learning disability. And this is an important area we feel for improving our healthcare access. So we have one project looking at that at the moment. Another area working again with London South Bank that's been inspired through this work is looking at providing autism training for GPs within the UK. So we're using our experiences as autistic doctors with the support of our, of our academic collaborations elsewhere to develop training that will hopefully improve, uh, or to improve GP's confidence dealing with autistic patients and providing adjustments for autistic patients in order to improve the experiences for everyone.